All right, welcome back. This is part three of our presentation. In this section, we're going to deal with refrigeration and our quest to get you ready to take the service exam for air-to-air -air heat pumps. Our purpose, again, is, like I said, to get you ready to take the exam. Prerequisites, view parts one and two before you get here. Have a pocket calculator to do the math we're going to encounter. And as the user, you're going to uh, assume all liability for application. Refrigeration system. Refrigerating system, however fancy you want to be. This is a vapor compression system because the compressor is a vapor pump. It's a pump that receives vapor, gas, and pumps it up to a different pressure, creating, adding the heat of compression and sending it out as a vapor. That's the compressor's job. If you send liquid back here, the compressor doesn't work anymore. Reciprocating compressor like this will compress liquid only one time, and that's the end of the valves. All right, the suction valves will bust right off because liquids will not compress, not to any value that's of use to us. And when they attempt to compress, the thing that will break when that piston hits top dead center in that cylinder is just like a car engine. You have an intake valve and a discharge valve. The intake valve, the suction valve, will be trapped closed, and when the piston comes up to top dead center, any liquid that's in there will be compressed, and you'll the the hydrostatic pressure created by that compression can be up to 9,000 pounds per square inch. This system is not designed for that. Neither of those valves, they'll bust right off. So, we bring back vapor, we compress the vapor, add the heat of compression, and it comes right out here. Okay, this is the discharge line. The line that leaves the compressor and enters the condensing coil is the discharge line. It is the point of greatest, highest superheat in the entire system. We don't normally care. We don't measure it here. We usually measure superheat on a suction line because we're interested in suction line superheat. But most of the superheat in the system is happening right here because of the high temperature. Now, these are real numbers from a 95-degree day with an R22 system, split system, three ton. If it comes out of here at 278 pounds and it's 200 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to have a hard time holding on to this line with your bare hands unless they're really calloused. That's a lot of heat. And this is air conditioning. This is not a heat pump. This is a straight up split system air conditioning unit, cooling system, all right, for a residence. Now, as that 200 degree vapor comes out of here, it enters the coil. And this condenser coil has secondary fins on it that are increase the heat transfer surface area and cause the heat to transfer out of this coil to the cooler air. Because the discharge from this coil is probably going to be, in a 95 degree day, it's going to be about 110 or so. Now, when I blow 95 degree air over this coil, it takes that 200 degree vapor that just entered here, and the first thing, the first few passes, what the, what the condenser does is desuperheat that vapor. It has to desuperheat that vapor, take all the superheat out of it, down to the point where it will start to condense, the, called the condensing temperature. Then it will condense. It will spend a good two-thirds of the coil surface area condensing from a liquid to a vapor. Now what happens is the condensing temperature here is 125 degrees. Why is the condensing temperature 125 degrees? Because the, the pressure is 278 pounds. Go to the chart. Oops, sorry. Go to the chart. Find 278 pounds on here. Right along here, around 278. Here's 280. 280.7 is 125 degrees. So if my condensing pressure is 280 pounds, which it is very close to, 
then my condensing temperature, because this is a saturation chart, is going to be 125 degrees. Understand that? So, going back to the chart, I take this 200 degree gas, I take 75 degrees away from it, and it becomes 125 degree gas. Now it can condense to a liquid at 125 degrees. And that's what it does in most of the surface area of this condenser. But the condenser has to do three things. Desuperheat, condense, and then the last few passes, it's going to subcool that liquid below the condensing temperature of 125 degrees. Now, why is subcooling important? And in this case, it went from 125 degree liquid to 105 degree liquid at virtually the same pressure. Now, I've made an adiabatic system, they call it, in that I've ignored the pressure drop from here to there. And there's probably maybe as much as a six pound pressure drop, but for our case here, it's really not important. So I'm keeping the same pressure. So we can concentrate on the physics as what's happening inside this unit. I have a 105 degree liquid that was previously 25, 125 degrees, so I've subcooled that liquid 20 degrees. Why is that important? For every degree of subcooling, you increase the efficiency of the system half a percent. So 20 degrees of subcooling gives me a system that's 10 percent more efficient than if I didn't have any subcooling. It also helps to guarantee that since now you have subcooled liquid, you've got to hurt yourself to not have a liquid seal at the entrance to the expansion device, whatever that is. I'm showing a, a, a TXV with a, a uh, uh, external equalizer, right? doesn't matter. It could be an orifice, could be a kink in a pipe, I don't care. Whatever your expansion device is, if you don't have a solid liquid seal at the entrance of it and at least a 100-pound pressure drop across it, your evaporator will have no refrigerating effect. It won't get cold. When a unit first starts up, if you're in the attic standing by the evaporator, air handler, whatever, the fan coil unit, <coughs> you will hear, even in a basement on an A-coil, you'll hear all this noise. That's all the vapor coming through mixed with the liquid. And every time vapor comes through here, you get nothing out here as far as cold. Because there's no expansion, nothing's changing. You've got a vapor going in, vapor coming out. You probably don't even have a good 100-pound pressure difference when the vapor goes through there. The result is compressor is still drawing 20 amps. So you're doing 20 amps worth of work. You should have a 40-degree evaporator, and you don't because you've got gas going through here instead of liquid. Instead of liquid coming out of this side and start to boil off, evaporate, you have gas going right through the system. So it's extremely inefficient. So that subcooling helps guarantee we'll have that flow. So we travel with that liquid up the liquid line. We go through the expansion device. When we do, we get to a lower pressure. And if we drop that pressure low enough to 68 pounds, what's going to happen? If we drop that pressure low enough to 68 pounds, we're going to have a 40-degree evaporator. If you go back and take a look at that uh, that saturation chart. And of course, if our airflow stinks, if the coil is clogged, then we're going to have frost and possibly, if it's clogged enough, if the airflow is poor enough, we're going to end up with an actual ice blocked coil. Because if you go look at the saturation chart, the lower the pressure, the lower the temperature. So if we reduce that pressure, we reduce the temperature. If we increase the temperature, we increase the pressure. So it comes in here, solid liquid, boils off, you know, and if everything is sized perfectly and the charge is perfect, at the very end of the run, as it becomes a suction line, we will have some superheat that we hope is adequate for our purpose. In other words, the last bit of liquid would have been boiled off. And in this case... At 68 pounds, we have 50 degree Fahrenheit. Not bad, 50 degree Fahrenheit. That, that 50 degree refrigerant is going to flow back. If you have an accumulator, it's going to enter and leave the accumulator in the form of gas. 
no matter even if this is liquid coming back, the accumulator will guarantee you only suck gas back into the head of the compressor to cool the motor off inside the compressor. That's what that cooled gas does. If this 50 degree gas here, vapor, picks up too much heat and then it maybe it comes back at 70 degrees, 70 degree vapor is not going to cool off that motor. It's way too hot. It's not going to be adequate. And that motor, the thermal overload built into the windings of that motor are going to open and the motor is going to stop running and you lost your cooling. And now you've got an open internal overload that depended on the operation of the system to keep it cool. Now the system's not operating. It's hermetically sealed, and it's got, how the heck is it going to cool off? It can't. It's going to take six, eight hours. Or you're going to do something silly like put a hose on top of it and create all kind of other problems. What else happens in this system here we can look at? Well, a restriction in either refrigerant line can cause sweating on that line. Remember over here when we said we'd ice block and all that stuff, we'd get really cold on this side? That's because we went from high pressure to low pressure. And once we took the pressure off, everything got colder. Over here it was 105 degrees, and that's because it was up to 278 pounds, and it was subcooled. When we dropped the pressure down over 200 pounds to 68 pounds, you look at the chart, it's now 40 degrees. So... Does it matter that it's being done by a device like a thermostatic expansion valve or a capillary tube or a kink in a line? Does that matter? No. What's going to happen on the other side of that, it's going to get cold. And if you've got a liquid line or a suction line outside and you create a restriction in it, it's going to get cold on the other side of the restriction. And when it does, if it's outside and it's damp, you're going to see sweating on the line because the hot air as it hits that cold pipe, is going to condense. The, the water in that hot air, the moisture in that hot air, will condense on that line and it will look like it's sweating. Suction line accumulator, right over here, should be installed on split systems with long line runs or underground piping. If you have more than 10 feet of piping underground, that's a subcooler. The ground temperature is cold. Dig down a foot or so and you know, you're at, uh, you're at pretty stable temperature. You're going to, in the northeast, you're going to start to get somewhere around 55, 60 degree ground temperature. And if you're bringing back warmer gas, it's going to condense to a liquid, and you're going to slug liquid into the compressor. So because this has a low inlet and a high outlet, it's going to take all the liquid and only suck gas back off of the top. Because if the accumulator, which looks like this in a vertical position, is sized properly, what you're supposed to do is estimate how much refrigerant is in your system, condense it all to a liquid, and then double that capacity, pick, a, pick an accumulator that can handle twice that. That way, under the worst case scenarios, it will never be filled with liquid because it has twice the capacity that your system has. That, that's what its job is. Long underground lines that would create subcooling of the suction gas, converting it back to a, to a recondensing it back to a liquid. You need it uh, whenever you have long line runs because when you add line length, you're going to add moi you're going to add uh, oil, you're going to add refrigerant because now if you if you don't, you're going to starve your evaporator. And if you're running a flooded evaporator for some reason, and you might be because of long line runs, then all your superheat's going to happen in a suction line. Or maybe not at all, and you're going to need the accumulator to collect all that liquid from slugging back and breaking the compressor valves. A clogged or dirty condenser coil, if this is clogged up with leaves or whatever, it's going to cause high head pressure. It's going to be out of whack. You want to see the head pressure go through the roof to the point where the internal pressure relief inside this compressor blows. And when that blows, it sounds like like a, a reversing valve, reversing position. It's internal. When there's a, I believe it's a 300-pound differential between the high side and the low side. When that exists, 
There's a pressure relief device inside that equalizes pressure inside the compressor dome to, will, to prevent damage from happening to the compressor. But if you want to see that happen, disconnect the wires from the condenser fan and let the unit run and the head pressure will run up like there's no tomorrow and eventually you'll hear that blow off. Now let's go to a heat pump. Why is this a heat pump? Same system I was looking at before. Yeah, well there's a couple differences and here are the differences of a heat pump. You get a reversing valve, a four-way valve. You also get a, a bypass and a check valve on the indoor and on the outdoor coil. So we had an expansion device here, we added one for this coil, and we also put the check valve bypass in. Now some units, more modern units, can use expansion devices that have check valves built into them. That's fine. But you're going to have either component, both components, whether it's combined into one or they're two separate components. Understand they are there. Or it ain't a heat pump. And the reason you added the second expansion valve is this coil is the evaporator in the summertime and in the wintertime it's the condenser. And this coil is the condenser in the summer and in the winter it's the evaporator. So in terms of heat pump you never refer to the evaporator and condenser. You say the outdoor unit, outdoor coil, and the indoor unit, the indoor coil. Because they change position as the, as the reversing valve switches. Now. This is what the reversing valve does. Watch this little U here. You see what it does? It transfers this gas to the suction line. Now when it changes position, it's transferring th this gas to the suction line. You see this little U slide back and forth? All right, just keep an eye on that. Watch it, back and forth, heating to cooling. All right, that's what's happening. Now I'm in the cooling mode here, so the reversing valve slid, slid to that position. The hot gas comes out of here, and where do I want the hot gas to go in the summertime? I don't want it to go in the house, I'm trying to cool it off. So it enters this reversing valve body, comes out of this side, and enters the tube like it should, uh, the uh, condensing unit. It desuperheats, condenses, subcools the gas. It leaves here, this is now liquid, it leaves the liquid line, and it sees a check valve, but the check valve is open in this direction. So the resistance to flow of the refrigerant is higher through this expansion device, which should be closed at this point. Okay. So as a result of that, it can't go this way, so it goes through the open check valve. Comes up here, sees this expansion device, which also offers resistance, it essentially tries to go this way, but that valve is closed. That valve will only allow flow in the opposite direction. So it's forced back up through this expansion device. It evaporates up here because it dropped its pressure. It, it, this now is the cold coil. It comes back through the suction line. It enters the four-way valve again, reversing valve, and goes into the accumulator before this becomes the true suction line. Actually, this is the true suction line at any point before or after the accumulator, but after the uh, reversing valve. That's how that works. Now, let's switch this to cooling mode. Now we got that 200, 150 degree gas, depending on the outdoor temperature. We're going to take that hot gas. We don't want it to go outside, not now. We want it to go inside and heat the house. So we're going to send it up the old suction line. This is a discharge line, okay? It's going to enter. The hot gas is going to enter with this coil, which is now the condenser coil. It's going to condense to a liquid. When it does, this begins the liquid line here. It can't go backward through a closed expansion valve, so it's going to go through the open check valve. It's going to come down the liquid line now as a liquid. This valve is closed. It's going to enter this expansion valve, and now the outdoor coil is going to be the cold coil because the pressure is going to drop here and the, the cold outdoor temperature of the air is going to condense and cause this to evaporate. The gases are going to come back here. It's going to go through the expansion valve again and into the true suction line through the accumulator 
back into the compressor as a vapor to cool it off. That's your heating season. So basically, all this reversing valve is doing is deciding where the hot gas is going to go. In the summertime, it's going to go outside. All right. In the wintertime, it's going to go inside. Superheat. Let's talk about that briefly. Superheat. Here's the way that works. Now, why are we even concerned about this? Well, the lack of superheat is going to tell us something. The presence of superheat is going to tell us the opposite of that. What's the temperature of this water boiling on my stove in Tampa, Florida at sea level? What is it? 212 degrees. You know that. How about the temperature of the steam directly above that water on my stove in Tampa? No, no lid on this thing. It's wide open to the atmosphere. 212 degrees. You know that. The steam. What's the temperature of the gas flame? About 3,400, 3,000 to 3,400 degrees. Natural gas burning in the atmosphere. That's the temperature of the gas. Where the heck did all that heat go? Why is this vapor and that water only 212 degrees? Why is that possible? It's a function of energy. All the energy, the heat that was taken out of that hot flame, was converted to steam. Every pint of water, every pound of water that evaporated the steam took away almost 1,100 BTUs. 1,070, 1,074, 970, you see all kind of numbers quoted, but it's about 1,100 degree, uh, BTUs for every pound of water that evaporates. That's where all the heat went. Now, what if I took my uh, cutting torch and I hooked it up to liquid... Uh, oxygen and, you know, uh, I, I had some other very volatile gas in there, and I got this flame temperature up to 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. What temperature would the steam be? 212 degrees, as long as I'm still at sea level. And the water would be 212 degrees. What would the difference be? The only difference would be you'd increase the rate at which the water evaporated and took that many BTUs away you would actually be able, at that temperature, you'd be able to watch the water drop down right to the last drop in the, in the thing within a few minutes, in the pot within a few minutes. And as soon as that last drop evaporated, you would have 10,000 degree steam. You cannot superheat a saturated vapor. This vapor is saturated because a moment ago it was a liquid. The only reason it's a vapor now is somebody added heat and caused that transference, that latent heat transfer. So it's impossible to superheat a vapor that's saturated. The only time you can raise the temperature of that vapor is when all the liquid that made it is gone. And that same principle applies to refrigerant as well as water. Superheat is added sensible heat above saturation. Sensible heat is heat you can see in a thermometer. So if I have superheat, if I have a superheated vapor coming back in my suction line, what's that tell me? I have no liquid. I can't. Because if I had liquid, it would be a saturated vapor. And it's not. It's superheated. And as long as it's superheated, all my liquid is gone. And my suction line has no liquid in it. And it won't slug my compressor. That's what it's telling me. That becomes important here when we're measuring superheat. And the way that works is this. If I measure 68 pounds here, and this is what you need to measure superheat, and, uh, you know, it says 68 pounds. I hook up my gauge. I hook up my thermometer to the pipe, and it says 60 degrees. Go to the chart. Let's see. 68 pounds is 40 degrees. But wait a minute, I measured, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. I measured 60 degrees, not 40 degrees. What happened? Well, it was saturated. Remember that chart is saturation. It was saturated at 40 degrees. That meant that at 68 pounds, it was 40 degrees if it was a mixture of vapor and liquid. 
But I don't have that anymore. What I have now is a superheated vapor. It's gone from 40 to 60. And the difference is 20 degrees. I have 20 degrees of superheat. And I just proved that. And the result of that is there is no liquid in this suction line. I am not going to flood my compressor. Is that good? What's the range? Well, you're allowed plus or minus 5 degrees. If the manufacturer says get 20 degrees of, sub of superheat, then you can be anywhere from 15 to 25. That's a 10 degree range. Superheat can only be used as a charging tool on fixed orifices. Capillary tubes, pistons, accurators, any fixed orifice. Can't be, it cannot be used on TXVs. Okay, that, that was superheat. Remember, you need to know two things. You need to know the suction line temperature and the suction line pressure. Then just go to your TP chart and do your work. But you need to know for superheat, you need to know those two things if you're looking at suction line superheat. Subcooling. Subcooling, same thing, except we don't do it on a suction line. We do it on a liquid line. I want to know liquid line pressure. I want to go to the chart and see what saturation should be for that pressure. And then I want to look at the temperature okay, of the liquid line. If I read 278 pounds and I go to the chart, 278 pounds is about 125 degrees condensing temperature. So if I go back here and I say 278 pounds should be 125 degrees, I put my thermometer on. It says it's not. It's 105. I have subcooled the liquid 20 degrees below the 125, uh, 125 degree condensing temperature. Now, subcooling is a little less lenient. You're allowed plus or minus 3 degrees. The result is you have a 6 degree span. So if the manufacturer said he wanted 20 degrees of subcooling, it could be anywhere from 17 to 23 degrees, a 6 degree range, and that would be acceptable. You use subcooling only on TXV, thermostatic expansion valves. And the reason you do that is the thermostatic expansion valve controls, because of the bulb, it controls the suction line superheat. You can't adjust the superheat. The valve is doing that. It's allowing the amount of refrigerant in here that will give it the superheat it wants. That's the way that valve works. If you look at this unit, adding, and this is true of, of any system, if you add refrigerant to the system, you will increase the subcooling and decrease the superheat. Here's the rule, and in fact the opposite is, if you remove the refrigerant from a system, you'll decrease the subcooling and increase the superheat. The reason is this. When you add gas refrigerant to a system, everything gets colder. The discharge line gets colder, the liquid line gets colder, the evaporator gets colder, the suction line gets colder. When that happens, when you add refrigerant, you make more subcooling, and because this line is cooler, you make less superheat. Okay? Suction line superheat. When you take out gas, the opposite thing happens. You decrease the subcooling, increase the superheat, because this line is going to get hotter. You took gas out. This line is going to get hotter. You're going to make less subcooling, more superheat. Here's the way the TXV, the thermostatic expansion valve, works. Essentially, it has three pressures. And what you want to know about this valve that's extremely important, and they will ask you about it in a test, and I know that because this happens to be bold italic, is that this valve is a constant superheat valve. It does not maintain a certain pressure in the evaporator. It does not maintain a certain temperature in the evaporator. The only thing this valve knows is what the superheat is at the point that that bulb is connected. And that is the amount of refrigerant this valve is going to allow into the evaporator to maintain that constant superheat. Now, here's how it works. There's three pressures that operate the valve. 
two of them tend to close the valve. The spring pressure, which can be adjusted on certain valves from this screw on the bottom, take cap off, put your, uh, what do you call it, an area screwdriver, and turn it in, you'll increase the pressure. Turn it out, you'll decrease the pressure. But that spring pressure works up against this diaphragm. See, this is one piece, and it's attached to the spring. And when it drops off, there's a needle valve right there that allows refrigerant to enter this valve and go into the evaporator. So the spring pressure is holding that closed. The other pressure that's working up the bottom of this diaphragm to keep that closed is the evaporator pressure. What, what kind of pressure do you have in your evaporator? The last one we looked at was 68 pounds. So now you have the pressure of the spring plus 68 pounds pushing up in the bottom of this diaphragm trying to keep that needle valve from dropping away and opening. The only pressure that opens it is the bulb pressure. What's in the bulb? Well, most of the time, it's what's in the system. If it's an R22, there's R22 in the bulb. If it's 410, there's 410 in the bulb. There's a thing called a cross charge where you mix different refrigerants to get a different effect. But residential, like commercial work, we don't typically use cross charges in our bulbs. So if I fill this bulb with liquid refrigerant, and it's large, and I connect a small capillary to it, I'm creating two things. First of all, what happens to liquid when it gets warmed by a hot suction line? It's going to expand, isn't it? And that big area here, expanding, increasing pressure into a small area, has a magnifying effect. And that effect... Anytime this is warm enough to create a pressure in this line that can overcome the back pressure of the, of the evaporator and the spring pressure, the valve seat is going to fall away and refrigerant is going to enter. When refrigerant goes into a system, what happens? Everything gets colder. This line will eventually get colder. What happens to liquid refrigerant in the bulb when it gets colder? It contracts. It condenses. That takes the pressure off the top of this diaphragm. The seat comes up and the valve closes. That's the way all TXVs work. If an external equalizer is used, okay, it's always connected ahead or after the uh, bulb down the suction line after the bulb. And what the external equalizer does is any time you have a 6-pound or more pressure drop across the evaporator, you need an external equalized valve because the pressure drop now is so great that the bulb can't overcome the pressure. So what you do is tap this well, and you take that pressure and you add it to the other side of the valve so that the pressure on the top of the valve and the pressure on the bottom of, the, of that diaphragm relative to the evaporator is the same. When that happens, it cancels out. If I have a diaphragm and I have a 1,000 pounds pressure on the bottom of it and a 1,000 pounds pressure on the top of it, the diaphragm doesn't see any pressure. If I reduce one side by one pound, now it sees a one pound pressure difference. That's the function of a diaphragm. So an external equalizer takes that excess pressure drop away and allows the valve to operate properly. Never attempt to adjust the spring on a residential TXV because you ain't never going to get it back where it should be. Now, where do you attach the bulb? Well, up to 7 8 inches, you either put it at 10 o'clock, this is a cross section of the suction line, or you put it at 2 o'clock. If it's over 7 8 8 o'clock, 4 o'clock. If it's in a vertical position, make sure the process stub is up, okay, not down. Because remember, this is filled with liquid. So if you turn that upside down, now the, and what you want to do is heat up a liquid that's going to put a pressure on the diaphragm. If you turn this upside down, the liquid runs out into the capillary tube. Now you have to heat up a mixture that's going to heat up a liquid that has to put pressure on a diaphragm. And what you'll get is a sloppy valve. It won't respond very well to the load. And the whole idea behind a TXV is that it responds to the load. The bigger the load, the wider it's going to open and the longer it's going to stay open. The other way to charge things and the other type of charge they're going to ask you about is weighing in. 
One pound is 16 ounces relative to the refrigerant. Don't lose sight of that. Weighing in as a liquid for both 410 and 22, I don't care what it is. If you take and try to weigh in a gas, you will spend the rest of your career there waiting for the pressures to equalize and unequalize. All right, so always weigh it in a liquid form. Now, you'll typically be given from the manufacturer a chart something like this, where he says if it's a 2.5 to 3 ton unit, and you've got a 3 quarter, 3 eighths line, and you're using R410A, then every foot of line set will have, and it needs an additional 0.56 ounces of refrigerant. If it's R22, you need 0.63 ounces per every foot of refrigerant to be added over and above. Now, to do that, you need an accurate scale, not a fish scale. Okay, you need an accurate electronic scale that can get you down to half an ounce. You'll be given a situation something like this. A new 3-ton R22 system comes with enough charge for itself, the most commonly sold evaporator, and 25 feet of line set. you got a 65 feet of line set. What do you do? How much charge do you add? Well, get the chart out. 3-ton system, if you're using that line size, you're going to have to add 0.63 ounces for every foot over 25 feet. You have 65 feet. Subtract 25, that's 40, times 0.63 per foot is 25.2 ounces have to be added to this system with a 65-foot charge uh, uh, line set in order to have the exact amount of refrigerant in that system you need for a proper charge. That's how you do it. Refrigeration piping. I'll call it rules of the road in uh, reference to my grandfather who worked on the railroads all his life and uh, used to teach the rules of the road to the guys in the cabooses at night when they were laid over somewhere. Because if you learn the rules of the railroad roads and, you know, you had situations like a freight train is bearing down, because in those days you didn't have two tracks, you had one. And if a freight train was bearing down on a passenger train, somebody had to pull off the siding to let the other one go by, or you had what people love to see, a train wreck, but never want to be in. He would teach under what circumstances the freight train had to pull off and under what circumstances the passenger train had to pull off. And you'd be surprised, a simple situation like that, how you really have to understand the rules of the road in order to make the right decision. So that's what I'm presenting here, the rules of the road for refrigeration piping. They are all piping and fitting must be clean and dry. Isolate all tubing and uh, from structural members in order to reduce vibration and noise transmission. Okay, don't nail it up tight with a, a clamp. Never solder vapor and liquid lines together. They should not even touch each other, and they must be insulated from each other. Otherwise, you're going to have heat transfer. You don't want to cool off that hot gas before it gets to the evaporator, and you don't want to condense the gases coming back that are now cool suction gases. Slope all piping, horizontal, horizontal piping, one inch and 20 feet in the direction of flow. Never coil excess tubing. This is on a test. You can see why. Never coil it vertically. What do you got here? What do you have right here? One, two oil traps. If you have to coil it, coil it horizontally so you don't trap the oil in it. You shouldn't be coiling anyway, for God's sakes. Cut it and learn how to braze. All right? People that do this don't know how to braze. They were given this length tubing, so they just hooked it up. Use long radius fittings wherever possible, except when fabricating P-traps. Okay? Long radius fittings offer less resistance to flow. The more resistance you have to the flow of refrigerant, just like air, the less capacity and efficiency you're going to get out of your system. In fact, if you make the suction line too small, you can reduce the capacity of the system by as much as a ton. Your five-ton system that needs an inch and an eighth suction line 
and you hook up a 7 8 suction line, you probably don't have a 5 ton system. You probably have a 4 ton system. Use PVC piping as a conduit for all underground piping. If underground piping exceeds 10 feet, install a suction line accumulator. Liquid line exposed directly to sunlight or high ambient temperatures such as attics or where you enclose it on an outside wall in a metal container like liter or something like that, insulate the liquid line. If you don't, it's going to flash off to gas. And then the liquid line going up here into the air handler is now going to be a mixture of liquid and vapor. And what you're going to get is a coil that's not as cold as you want it. And you're going to have tremendous inefficiencies. Use hard drawn type L ACR, air conditioning refrigeration copper, not plain copper that a, a plumber would use for water piping. Do you know how they clean the inside of copper tubing they use for water piping? They run an acid through it. You want acid in a refrigeration system? Think again about that. ACR tubing, when you get it in 20 foot lengths, is capped on both ends and probably has a dry nitrogen or helium inside of it to prevent any moisture from entering it. Not that the, the dry uh, gas does that. The dry gas is dry just so it doesn't bring moisture in, but it's pressurized so it doesn't allow outside air to leak in with the moisture. Braze all copper to copper joints with a minimum of 5% silver solder or equivalent like silphos, which is a phosphorus, silver phosphorus combination. Do not use soft solder. Silver, soft silver solder has no application in refrigeration work. Way too much vibration, way too much pressure. During brazing, bleed at about 2 pounds or less an inner gas like dry nitrogen through the system. Continue bleeding while the joint cools. If you allow the bleeding process to take place, you know, take the, the, the Schrader valves out of the fittings or whatever, the service valves, and allow the, the nitrogen to go through the system, what it will do is prevent oxidation on the inside of the fitting as it cools because that's when the oxidation happens. Whatever you do, never braze a fitting in high temperature and then throw water on it or spit on it or spill your beer on it or something like that. You'll crystallize the filler material and you will almost assuredly create a leak down the road at some point in time because that metal, because of that shock, became annealed. It became less hard. Suction line pressure, loss reduces the system capacity by 1% per pound. Therefore, you're limited to a 3 degree, 3 pound pressure drop in your suction line. 5 pound for 410A, 3 pound for 22. Refrigerant gas velocities in a suction line riser, you know, a riser going up to a building, up to a condenser that's above the evaporator, must be at, at least a thousand feet per minute in order to entrain the oil in that return air. Otherwise, you're not going to get the oil back up again. And you can even reduce the size of the riser in order to get that velocity. You may also, excuse me, have to employ suction line P traps to do that. Suction line gas velocities must be kept below a 3,000 feet a minute above 1,000 but below 3,000 in order to avoid noise and vibration problems. It will sound like a, a, a swirling inside the suction line. And if you bring that suction line inside, up inside to the attic in, in, in an inside wall where there's no insulation to absorb that sound, it magnifies. It's like yelling into an empty garbage can. Liquid pressure loss reduces the amount of liquid subcooling, so on and so forth. You're limited to a 30-pound pressure drop for 22 in a liquid line and a 50-pound pressure drop in a liquid line for R410A. 
if you don't do that, if, if you have a pressure drop that exceeds that, you're going to get flash gas, which is going to reduce the refrigerant flow through the expansion device. It's going to limit the capacity. It's going to limit the efficiency of the system. The liquid static pressure loss in a liquid line riser is equal to one-half pound per foot of height. So if you've got a 10-foot riser in your liquid line and you're going into an evaporator, 10-foot riser, that's another 5 pounds of pressure. If the evaporator is installed below the condenser, then the excess static pressure a head that you're going to create in the liquid line may necessitate a change in the metering device using a smaller orifice. And even TXVs have an orifice in the distributor of the TXV. And that may have to be changed. If you have a real tall, 5 pounds is no big deal. But if you have a 30, 40 foot, something like that, what's 40 feet? That's 20 pounds pressure more. If you increase the pressure, you're going to increase the flow of refrigerant through the evaporator. And if that's not supposed to happen, and it's not in most cases, then what you're going to do is end up with a flooded evaporator, and you're going to flood liquid back and bust the uh, suction line valves uh, on the compressor. All right? The total pressure loss is the sum of the friction plus the static. Okay? Friction is the movement of the refrigerant through the walls that create friction and resistance, and static is the pressure in the system that the, the flow rate has to overcome. Refrigerant liquid detection. Well, a vacuum pump can tell you if you have a leak. All right, can't tell you where the leak is, but it'll tell you how to leak because you can't hold a vacuum. You can pressurize the system with nitrogen, refrigerant, whatever, and if you can't hold the pressure, you got a leak. Don't know where the heck it is, but there's definitely a leak. Soap bubbles will pinpoint a leak if you can get it where the leak is. You don't want to be going soaping the entire condenser coil looking for a leak. But if you suspect there's a leak, look at the fittings, especially the ones you just sweated. All right? And soap them up and see if you can see the bubbles expand and, and show you a leak. Electronic leak detectors are sensitive, they can find a leak as low as half an ounce a year. Ultrasonic leak detectors, they can hear a flatulent ant. Okay? Uh, the ant, not your Aunt Bessie. I'm talking about the insect, the small ant. If it breaks wind, this thing will hear it. It can hear an orifice. Okay, it can hear a gas either expanding out of or going into an orifice. That's the sound it makes. It's ultrasonic, but they lose their sensitivity when you get in a noisy boiler room. If you have a B&G pump with a bad bearing, it's going to tell you it has a leak at the pump bearing. Dye. You can put dyes in your refrigeration system. Circulate the dye and look for it discharged, usually with an ultraviolet light or something that shows it up better. Remember Ditel in the old days? Ditel they used to put, DuPont used to put in the refrigerants. It was a purple dye that you could see without a UV light. And, of course, we found out that there's a lot of leaks in a lot of places, and we're very sloppy in the way we use refrigerant, and that Ditel was all over everything. The pads, it was all over. The, 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 any fitting you had, it was a nightmare. The problem with the dyes we use today that the ultraviolet light sense is that it takes time. They have to be in the system while the system is in operation for 24 hours because the dyes mix with the oil, and it takes about that time, 24 hours of operation, for the, all the oil to go back and out of the system and back to the system again. Halide torch, 1920s technology. What you do is you create a, a light here, and inside that flame is a copper plate. And because this is hot, it creates a stack effect, if you will. It, it will pull because it's connected to this tube. And this is the gas you're using, butane, whatever else, LP, whatever they use in those systems. And if you attach this hose, if you, if you move it around a condenser coil, for instance, and you find refrigerant, 
that has chlorine in it, a chlorinated refrigerant like R22 or 12 or something like that, it'll pull the gas in and when chlorine burns in the presence of copper, the flame will turn from blue to green. And that's when you know you have a leak. Uh, again, most of the refrigerants we're using or starting to use now don't even have chlorine, so halide torch is useless. Not to mention the fact that it's extremely old technology. The obvious things to look for, you see oil like that under a fitting or around a line or a condensing unit. Look inside the condensing unit, see if you see oil around the base of the coil. you got a leak. All right, and if you find where the oil is, you'll find where the leak is. Service valves. Okay, we're flip-flopping here, but a service valve on a compressor looks like this. This is where the gauge port is attached. This is where the system is, and, you know, the, the line coming in from the system, and, you know, suction line, liquid line, whatever valve you're on, and this is the, where it's attached right to the compressor. And if you front seat that valve, what you do is isolate the compressor from the line set. If you back seat the valve, you open the line set to the compressor. If you, and, and by the way, when it's back seated, that's when you can connect your gauge port, your gauge manifold. Because here, if you connected it, you would be connected directly to the compressor. In this case, when you connect it, the line set is connected to the compressor and you have no pressure at that valve port. And notice that this is an open valve port. It's, there's no Schrader inside of it. That's, that's removed. This is a true service valve. So if you want to check the pressure, the valve has to be backseated. You connect the gauge and then you mid-seat the valve so that it's still open to the compressor and the system can operate, but at the same time, you can check what that pressure is, high side or low side, depending on which service valve you connect it to. Thank you for your time and attention. You know what comes next. All right, it's Q&A time, boys and girls. All right, let's do this. Number one, what is the function of the condenser coil? What's its job? Desuperheat the vapor from the compressor, condense the refrigerant vapor to a liquid, subcool the liquid refrigerant, all of the above. What's the condenser's job? Yeah, man, everything. It's got to desuperheat, condense, and subcool. Two, in what part of the refrigeration circuit does the refrigerant boil? Condenser? Evaporator, compressor, line set. Where does boiling take place? Well, boiling and evaporating are the same thing. Just one implies a faster rate than the other. What you're doing when something boils, evaporates, vaporizes, it takes heat away. And that's what the evaporator is doing. That's the cold coil. It's taking the heat out of the air. The evaporation process is removing heat from the, I don't know, 80 degree return air and giving you 60 degree supply air. Three, the heat that is removed from the refrigerant in the condenser is conductive, entropy, enthalpy, sensible, and latent. What, what type of heat is being removed? Sensible and latent. That is happening in the condenser. You're changing state, so you have latent heat involved, and, you know, the refrigerant is changing state, and you're certainly changing the temperature of the refrigerant. That's the type of heat that's being removed from the refrigerant. is sensible and latent because you have a change of state and because you have a change in temperature. Four, a suction line accumulator should be employed whenever... There is a long line set or underground piping. The evaporator is above the condenser by more than 20 feet. The condenser is above the evaporator by more than 25 feet. The total line length exceeds 100 feet. At what point do you need a suction line accumulator? Do you remember the rules of the road? 
Anytime you get a long line set run and a hundred may not necessarily be long and you got or you have underground piping. Five, in the simplest form, in its simplest form, a compressor is a device that imparts velocity to the refrigerant, a device that creates liquid refrigerant from vapor, a vapor pump, a device that converts vapor to liquid. What does the compressor do? Yeah, it, it, it's a vapor pump. It takes low pressure, low temperature vapor, pumps it up, increases its pressure to high pressure, adds the heat of compression, so it becomes a high pressure, high temperature vapor that enters the discharge line from the compressor. Six, a clogged air filter or dirty evaporator can cause ice, frost on the, on the evaporator, low suction pressure, liquid refrigerant flood back to the compressor, all the above. Yeah, man, all that. Ice, frost, low, you're going to get a result of that is low airflow. That will create low suction pressure, which is going to cause liquid flood back to the compressor. You can't boil it off because you don't have the heat on that coil from the return air to evaporate it and cause boiling. Then it's going to not boil off and flood back as a liquid and the pressure resulting drop associated with that. What will cause a liquid line to sweat? What will cause a liquid line to sweat? An overcharge system? A kink in, or restriction in the, in the line? A liquid floodback? Or all the above? What, what would cause the liquid line to sweat? Yeah, kink in the line. A restriction in the line will cause that. Especially on a hot day. Causes expansion. Expansion makes it colder on the other side of the, in the direction of flow, on the other side of the uh, kink. And if it's hot outside, the hot, moist air is going to condense on the cold liquid line. A clogged or restricted condenser coil will cause high head pressure, low head pressure, low suction pressure, and ice blocked evaporator. What, what is a clogged or restricted condenser coil going to cause? Yeah, high head pressure. Okay, a clogged or restricted condenser coil. Cut the condenser fan off, watch the head pressure go out of sight. Nine, superheat is the saturation temperature of the refrigerant at a given pressure, the vapor temperature of the refrigerant at a given pressure, added sensible heat above saturation, added latent heat above saturation. What, what is superheat? What, what, which of these best defines that? Added superheat above saturation. Ten. Can you superheat a saturated vapor? Yes. No. Only at temperatures below saturation. Only if the vapor has been subcooled. Can you superheat a saturated vapor? It's absolutely impossible to superheat a vapor that's saturated. Superheat means all the liquid's gone, and now it's a dry vapor. That if you increase the temperature relative to it, its temperature will increase. 11. To determine the superheat of an operating refrigeration system, you must know suction line temperature and liquid line pressure, liquid line temperature and ambient temperature, liquid line temperature and pressure, suction line temperature and pressure. What do you need to know to determine superheat? Yeah, suction line temperature and pressure. 12. Superheat is a relevant method of charging a refrigeration system that uses a hard shutoff TXV metering device, any TXV metering device, fixed orifice metering de device, excuse me, an evaporator pressure regulator. Where, where do you use superheat? 
fixed office. It's the only place you can use it. How about subcooling? Where do you use subcooling as a relevant method of charging a refrigeration system? If it has a hard shutoff TXV, a TXV, you know what a hard shutoff is, by the way. It's when the TXV shuts down. It doesn't bleed high side to low side. It holds the high side high. That's called hard shutoff. Okay. Any TXV metering device, a fixed orifice metering device, an evaporator pressure regulator. At what point is subcooling relevant? Any kind of TXV you got. I don't care if it's, you know, hard shut off or if it's uh, externally equal. I don't care what it is. If it's a TXV, you use subcooling. Because it's a TXV, it is controlling the superheat. You can't adjust it. Only the valve can do that. 14. The following is an operating R22 unit. The high side is 260 pounds. Low side pressure is 70 pounds. Liquid line temperature is 110 degrees. Suction line temperature is 55 degrees. And the outdoor temperature is 83 degrees. What's the superheat on this system? 10 degrees? 12? 14? 16 degrees. It's one of them. What, <laughs> what is it? Okay, superheat is suction line temperature minus saturation temperature. The saturation temperature, okay, for what do we give you for a low side press? 70 pounds is 41 degrees. That's the saturation temperature. 41 minus the 55 degree that the suction line was, 41 minus 55 is 14. That's how you're going to have to do this on a test. And on a test, they're, they're going to give you all this information, and they're going to give you a TP chart, a temperature pressure chart, okay, or PT chart. I call the PT chart a TP chart because it's toilet paper for most of us. Fifteen. The following is an operating 22 unit. Same thing, 260 high, 70 low, 110 on liquid line, 55 degree suction. All right, temperature, 83 degrees outside. What, what's the subcooling? Is it 10, 12, 14, or 16 degrees? Well, subcooling is saturation minus liquid line temperature. You said the liquid line temperature was what? 110 degrees. And that at 260 pounds, it would have been about 120 degrees if it was if it was properly condensed, saturated. Okay? Subtract the 120 from the 110 degree temperature it actually is, and you have 10 degrees of subcooling. Again, you're going to be given a chart and then necessary information. You have to decide, of all this information they gave me, what's relevant to find subcooling. Well, the only thing that's relevant is the high side pressure and temperature. All the rest of this stuff is what you call peripheral or something to distract you from the correct answer. These are called, uh, of the four, one of them is the correct answer. The others are legitimately called distractors. They're supposed to distract you from the correct answer. When you take a test construction course, that's what they call the things that are not the correct answers, the distractors. 16. What happens to a refrigerating system when refrigerant is added into it? Subcooling and superheat are increased. Subcooling and superheat are decreased. Subcooling is decreased. Superheat is increased. Subcooling is increased, superheat is de decreased. What, what, what happens when you add refrigerant to a system? Everything gets colder. Subcooling is increased, superheat is decreased because everything got colder. 17. The function of a thermostatic expansion valve is to maintain a constant temperature drop over the evaporator, maintain a constant pressure in the evaporator, Maintain a constant superheat at the outlet of the evaporator 
or maintain a constant subcooling at the inlet of the evaporator. What's the function of the TXV? Yeah, man, maintain a constant sub superheat at the outlet of the evaporator. That's all it can do. You can't do that if you've got a TXV. Only the valve itself can maintain that. Because if you try to charge it to superheat, and the valve, um, the valve sees that the evaporator is cool enough, it shuts down. And you can't get gas into the system to get that superheat you think you should have. The valve controls that, not you. 18. The external equalizer line on a TXV should be connected on a suction line ahead of the bulb, on a suction line after the bulb, to the evaporator manifold, to the liquid line. Where does this get connected? After, downstream from the bulb, not ahead before the bulb. 19. On a 7-8 suction line, the bulb the, from the TXV should be attached to the suction line at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock or 2 o'clock, not in between, one or the other. It should be 8 o'clock and 4 o'clock, 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock at any position as long as the, it's daylight savings time. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. So where do you attach it? At what position relative to a clock? Yeah, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. If it's seven eighths, uh, a new condenser comes from the factory with enough charge for itself, the most commonly sold evaporator, and 15 feet of line set. You have a 65 foot line set. The manufacturer calls for 0.6 ounces of refrigerant per foot of line set. How much charge needs to be added to the system? Now watch when that question is asked. I'll ask you one of two things. How much charge do you need to add or how much charge is in this system? Two completely different questions. In this case, we've been asked how much charge needs to be added to this system. 9 ounces, 15 ounces, 30 ounces, 39 ounces. How much? Well, how are you going to get there? Well, 65 feet is your line set. It comes from the factory with 15 foot of charge already condensed in the condenser. 15 from 65 is 50. Manufacturer said for every foot of, of refrigerant tubing you need 0.6. That's 30 ounces. Do the math. It's that simple. 21. When installing refrigerant tubing, it is always best to have metal-to-metal -metal contact with both lines, liquid and suction. Use rigid hangers for support. Firmly attach the tubing to the structure. Isolate the tubing from the building structure. Of these four things, what's important when installing refrigeration tubing? Yeah, make sure it's isolated from the building so the vibration in that tubing and the velocity in the tubing is not transferred in the form of vibration to the structure, which will transfer the noise. Excess refrigeration tubing should be coiled vertically, coiled horizontally, eliminated, never longer than 7 feet. What's the best answer here? Coiled horizontally. Why wouldn't you just, why wouldn't eliminate the tubing be better? Because sometimes, here's the deal. All manufacturers have a minimum line length that must be established by you in the field on a split system condenser. If you don't have that minimum line length, then you need to coil up the tubing to establish it and usually it's somewhere between 10 and 15 being the minimum line length you can have. The reason is you've got to have a place for subcooling and superheat to happen. If you don't, the manufacturer has to make the coil bigger 
for the superheat to happen in the coil or the subcooling to happen in the condenser. And this is a split system. you got a line set. So don't think you, you can't ever have tubing coiled up. From time to time, if you've got a, a, a basement installation and the furnace is right up against the outside wall, and on the other side of that wall is the condenser, heck, you could have a three-foot line set. But that is way under the manufacturer's minimum of, let's say, 10 feet. So you better run 10 foot of tubing and then coil the the tubing up horizontally in the uh, at, I'm sorry in the basement ceiling where no one can really pay attention to it and then run that short piece of tubing outside. 23 copper line set should be soldered with at least 95.5 solder mechanically joined soldered with a soft silver solder or brazed with an inner gas while an inner, inner, inner gas is bled through the tubing. What's the best deal here for copper line sets? Yeah, man, brazed and, and let that inner gas bleed through the system while you're brazing. 24. What is the maximum permissible pressure drop for a properly sized suction line. 3 pound, 6 pound, 15 pound, 30 pound. What's the maximum pressure drop you can allow in a suction line from the outlet of the evaporator to the inlet of the condensing unit? It's 3 pounds. 3 pounds in the case of R22. And always assume they're talking about R22 unless they state otherwise on this exam. Because at this point in time, in uh, what month are we in? November of 2008, 2008, there are no questions on the exam about R410A. Nor variable speed air handlers, nor scroll compressors. So when they say the compressor, they're talking about a reciprocating compressor. When they say the refrigerant, they're probably talking about 22, unless they state otherwise. And when they talk about the blower, it's a fixed speed PSC motor that's attached to that blower. 25. Resistance added to a line set in the form of fittings, elbows, tees, whatever, will cause what to happen to the refrigerant flow and the system. It will increase the pressure drop with an increase in efficiency and capacity. Added resistance will decrease the pressure drop with a decrease in efficiency and capacity. It will increase the pressure drop and a decrease in efficiency and capacity. Or it will decrease the pressure drop with an increase in efficiency and capacity. It, this can make you go blind when you're, you know, you're at your 120 some questions and you're at the 125th, 126th question. This can make you say, I don't care. Just pick one. Don't do that. Okay. Don't give up a question. Increased resistance is going to cause an increase in the pressure drop and therefore a decrease in efficiency and capacity. Put enough elbows in, you won't be circulating any refrigerant that's worth a darn. 26. To pinpoint the location of the refrigeration leak, you need to use which of the following? Soap bubbles, a vacuum pump, nitrogen pressure, or any of these will pinpoint the location of a refrigeration leak. Soap bubbles, the only thing that's going to do that. 27. Electronic leak detectors can detect leaks as small as 0 0.05 ounces a year, 0.5 ounces a year, 1 ounce a year, 1.5, one 1.5 one ounces per year. Uh, how sensitive are electronic leak detectors? Yeah, they, they can find half an ounce. This whole system, over the course of 12 months, loses half an ounce a properly calibrated electronic leak detector will find it. 
28. An obvious indication of a refrigeration leak would be the presence of oil, condensation on the liquid line, high head pressure, high suction pressure. What's going to be an obvious indication of a leak? Presence of oil. The oil is leaking out because the oil is entrained with the refrigerant and moves throughout the entire system. 29. To check the system pressure on an operating unit, the service valve must be, and they're talking about a true service valve, a true king valve, must be front seated, back seated, mid seated in any position. Yeah, you got to be mid seated. Look back at the slides we talked about the service valves. 30, if a capillary tube on a TXV has been cut, what will happen on a call for cooling? The capillary tube that connects the bulb to the TXV is cut. What's going to happen on a call for cooling? Low side pressure will increase. High side pressure will decrease. Temperature drop over the evaporator will increase. The system will pump down. You know, the low side will go into a vacuum. What's going to happen? Yeah, low side's going to pump down. If I go into a supply house and it's 70 degrees and they've got a TXV in a box, brand new, in good shape, not connected to anything, what position is that valve in? It's completely wide open because it's, the bulb is sensing 70 degrees, which is warm when you want a 40 degree evaporator. You have very high superheat sensed at that bulb at that point in time, 70 degrees which is really high when you're trying to maintain a 40 degree evaporator. So the result is the valve is going to be wide open. So when the capillary tube is cut, there is no bulb pressure. The result is the valve slams closed, and the result of that is it's going to pump down. Now you've shut off the liquid line, and the compressor is still working, and it's going to pump down all the refrigerant, on the low side into the accumulator and or back into the uh, high side of the system. Okay, it's going to be stored in the compressor, if you will. See you at part four, hopefully.